I'm Hilbert and this is History with Hilbert and welcome to today's episode on the Peaky Fucking Blinders. I personally think I'd have a great Brummie accent, although opinions are divided. So for those of you who don't know, the Peaky Blinders is a CTV series that's on the moment, on at the moment on the BBC, and it's set in the 1920s and follows the exploits of the Shelby brothers, three brothers who made up a gang, or in the series they make up a gang called the Peaky Blinders. And this is actually based on real history a lot of the time, and they cover a lot of historical topics. So even if you don't watch the show, I'm going to invite you to stick around because I'm going to be talking about a lot of different history stretching from the Irish rising and the IRA to uh, the Russian Revolution, the spread of communism and socialism throughout Europe and the various integration of different ethnic groups throughout England during the 1920s and the early 20th century as a whole. So I think it's going to be a really interesting one if you're interested in early 20th century history uh, at all and yeah so let's crack on. So the Peaky Blinders as I said it's a TV series and it's actually based on a real gang who were called the Peaky Peaky Blinders from Birmingham from an area called Small Heath or Small Heath as they say in the show and um, while this was a real gang obviously this show is set in the 1920s however the Peaky Blinders were at large at the end the last decade of the 19th century and that's when they sort of um, lose their position as the prominent street gang of Birmingham and what they did was they are called Peaky Blinders not because as the show shows them having razor blades stuck in their hats so that the hats they're wearing are called peaked caps, which came into fashion around this time are, are in the, the working classes of people in large industrial cities like Birmingham or Manchester, um, potentially London later on as well. And that the, the show says that they then sewed razor blades into the top of their hats so that they could take them off. And it's there's a scene in the show where they do this. They take them off and they whack people across the face with them, essentially blinding them so it becomes a weapon. But there's no actual evidence for this. And actually, instead, like I said, the hats were called peakies so they think that's why they called them peaky because they were working lower class men and blinders because blinder was another word for slugger which was a fighter that kind of thing and they were before this the the peaky blinder gang were called sloggers this kind of thing um, and they were quite small gangs not like the kind of mafia idea of a gang today the small groups of men who would go to the race courses where there was a lot of betting going on and they would offer the various people taking in the bets protection which obviously means by offering they would they were forcing them to pay them some of the earnings they were getting to protect them from the other gangs who were protecting other bet makers and you know bookies that kind of thing and you do see this in the show as well which is very interesting now obviously as I said you get a lot of different history in this as well it's set in the 1920s so you have all sorts of the class divisions the rise of communism you've got things going on in Ireland the various gangs different ethnic groups going on and I'm going to take a look at all of that in this video so first of all what I'd like to look at is the impact of the first world war which was huge on British society now obviously it's set in the 1920s so pretty much all the young men and pretty much all the men have fought in and been scarred by the First World War and really it was a huge thing obviously it was the first time that so many men in England practically all the men of the age unless they hadn't gone to war in which case they were shamed and it does play a part in the show as well that the commander Campbell that it's always brought up that he didn't go over to France to fight and that he's therefore a coward but all these men went to France to fight in the First World War which was a a horrific war the amount of people who came back completely destroyed by the war by what they called shell shock back then and we now call post-traumatic stress disorder is amazing as you can see the guy in the picture has the thousand yard stare which is just this glazed over expression and those who weren't completely mentally knackered from the war and you do see that in the show as well Arthur Shelby he has really bad post-traumatic stress disorder and deals with it in a violent way with alcohol and drugs and he has a lot of issues as does Danny in the first season who is also a veteran who comes back and forgets he's actually in England and he wakes up thinking he's in France and in the trenches as does Tommy although Tommy deals with it in a different way and really when you see it this way it's very interesting because all these men have gone out to fight they've seen horrific things you know from all sorts of different backgrounds from just working class people in Birmingham go out to France and they'd see you know their best friends their their heads being shot off and awful things that we can't even comprehend and then suddenly they'd come back 
to England after sometimes four years of being away to fighting and they'd be back in the same very poor conditions. Remember, it's this is before a lot of the social welfare things have kicked in. So people were incredibly poor. The, the cities were very overcrowded still, even after the reforms in sort of the, the late 19th century that did do a lot, but still these these people were very poor um, and, and lived in very overcrowded areas and suddenly all these people came back and then it's no wonder that quite a few of these gangs would pop up because people as Tommy Shelby is he comes back and oh yeah and I should mention there will be spoilers obviously because I'm going to be talking about the show and it's mentioned that he was a communist before going out or was a member of the communist party and I think the best way to describe Tommy Shelby is disillusioned and it's easy to see because of all this horror that they witnessed in France and then when they came back you know their situations hadn't improved so then a lot of these men kind of went rogue and that's essentially where the Peaky Blinders comes from the idea in the show that they then came back although there is something mentioned that they had an organization already before the war but then they come back and perhaps that's why they were able to do such awful things to other people like the blindings and, and things like that because they'd witnessed such horror in France and in Belgium during the, the First World War. It's quite an interesting sort of premise for the whole series. Now, obviously, the plot of season one that gets it all kicked off is that Tommy Shelby, some of his men, accidentally unload the wrong box when they, uh, I think they were meant to be getting cigarettes, but instead they took they took one from the British Army completely by accident and found a crate full of 25 Lewis guns, Lewis guns being early machine guns of the time, and that's sort of what the plot of the first one revolves around, because um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but the British were trying to ship this crate of Lewis guns to Libya. However, the IRA had taken it off the train. So the IRA get involved. The IRA, for those of you who aren't aware, are the Irish Republicans Army. And I will cover them right now. So in 1916, obviously slap bang in the middle of the First World War. In, on Easter Sunday, there was a rising in Ireland. Now, Ireland at this time was part of the United Kingdom, although there was very much um, a sense of tension between certain people in Ireland and the United Kingdom. One big misconception is that everyone in Ireland hated the British. Before the Easter Rising, this certainly isn't true. The group of Irishmen who did not like the British having control over Ireland were called the Fenians at this time, going back to this a really old idea, a Dark Age idea even, of groups of uh, essentially bandits young men who would go out and a bit like the Peaky Blinders they'd go out and do you know commit acts and go off and, and pillage people that kind of thing um, but anyway that's that's by the by but on in on Easter Sunday there was a rising in Ireland in Dublin and other parts of the country where members of the Irish Republicans army who were fighting for the independence of Ireland captured various places in Dublin famously the post office and declared the Irish nation free from British subjugation and this is essentially the start of Ireland's process towards becoming an independent country towards the start of the Republic of Ireland um, and now as I was saying obviously this did actually happen that's why we have Ireland today although as you will know if you've seen any of my videos or know anything about Ireland is that the whole island isn't part of one country the north actually remained part I think the northern six counties uh, remained part of the United Kingdom because thanks to it's a long story but essentially the British uh, monarchs they planted English Scots and Welsh uh, Protestants in the northeast to subjugate the various the very strong Gallic resistance there which is why you had a lot of people in the northeast who were in the region traditionally called Ulster who were very pro-British and unionist orangist they're also called there's so much history to go into here but I will resist the temptation and um, they wanted to remain with the United Kingdom which is a clause but we'll get into that later as well because in the in the second season this becomes an issue because some of the IRA accepted the treaty that these six counties would go to the United Kingdom and some of them didn't and this was actually one of the causes or the main cause for the Irish Civil War which was right after they'd earned their independence the IRA started fighting among themselves of pro-treaty and anti-treaty and that's where you get the premise of the second season with the various IRA factions trying to use Tommy and the British government against one another because they want to get an upper hand in this civil war. 
But yes, as I was saying, in 1916, the IRA captured various areas in Dublin, like the post office, and declared the Irish Republic a thing. However, the British did come in and they did clear out the Irish before too long, and the rising was pretty much a complete failure. However, the harsh treatment of the Irish they took captive and the leaders meant that the people in Ireland became very anti-British because they saw how they were being treated and the British really shot themselves in the foot by doing this because then suddenly the Irish population became increasingly hostile and it's from that point on that the Irish War of Independence starts which was from 1919, uh, the January of 1919 until 1922 which is when this treaty was signed when the Irish, the IRA, they were fighting a guerrilla war against the uh, British, especially the Black and Tans, which is the officer that Tommy has to shoot. Uh, Black and Tans were mostly Scots, I believe, who were uh, Protestant and they were sent to Ireland and they were known for being incredibly ruthless towards the native Irish, a lot of whom were Catholic, especially the uh, IRA, uh, who were opposing the British, which is another dimension to the Irish conflict. However, at the same time as the guerrilla war was going on, obviously guerrillas, they need money, they need troops, they need uh, ammunition, they need guns, that kind of thing, which is why the Lewis guns were so important to them, which is why that all played out. And they obviously had people undercover who went to England, as well as America. A lot of financing for the IRA came from America because, hey-ho, you know, a lot of Irishmen went over to America, so there was strong support for them there, which is where you get sort of the IRA secret agents coming over to Birmingham, that kind of thing. Because remember, Birmingham is in uh, is it in the West Midlands I think it's the West Midlands yeah so that's sort of more towards the Irish Sea probably uh, they'd come in through Liverpool and then down to Birmingham over the railways now at the same time you have a lot of class distinction now I absolutely love the aesthetics of the Peaky Blinders of wearing the peaked caps that kind of thing um, even though they do wear the kind of uh, the posher suits because obviously the the gang become very rich so they can afford this kind of thing and you can instantly tell the difference which is something that I love between them the kind of the the working class ruffians the members of the Peaky Blinders gang and the uh, upper class very posh people and some of my favorite scenes in the entire series one of them is when they're at the race course and they're surrounded by all these you know really posh uh, rah rah the, the, the people who would say that very naturally kind of thing wearing the uh, top hats and, and jackets and then you have you know the, the peaky blinder lads with their caps on and uh, <laughs> which it's just one of the images that I absolutely love from the show and at the same time you had a very clear class system arguably you still do in the United Kingdom and this is one of the reasons why communism and socialism plays a large part in this now obviously you have Freddie Thorne who is the prominent communist in season one as well as uh, various striking action that they they take part of and something that I'd also like to mention is the role of the sort of the the, the the suffragette movement or technically the post suffragette movement um, because most of the suffragette stuff was done before World War One and then after World War One is when women got the vote in the United Kingdom over a certain age and then but obviously it, wage equality had not yet been reached and then that's also played uh, a part in the Peaky Blinders series. Um, but as I was saying, this kind of drive towards socialism is very understandable when you see some of the conditions that the people were working in. And that was one of the ways in which people protested against having gone out to France. Remember, all the men had served their king. They'd lost brothers and friends. And then they came back and, you know, their conditions hadn't improved. So a lot of them, as is very clearly shown in uh, the first season, you know, they join communist parties, which were very popular in big industrial cities in England, as well as throughout Europe during this time. Now, this is all very much related to what's the Russian Revolution, which is obviously 1917. Uh, Russia was at war with Germany on the Eastern Front. They did abysmally badly. I actually have a video about this if you're interested. And there was a revolution Um when obviously the the russians they went down the slippery slope of communism um, when they had their revolution and obviously this inspired a lot of people back in england and throughout europe to do the same which is why you have after world war one in germany various times that the communists threatened to capture germany uh, for example the spartacists in 1919 and the red ruhr uprising as well as i believe bavaria went communist for a while in germany 
But at the same time, you had the ousted members of the old elite. You had disillusioned liberals and sort of the traditionalists in Russia who formed the White Russians. And there was a civil war in Russia between the Reds, so the communists, uh, the Bolsheviks and the White Russians for a long time, who were supported by most of the nations of Europe because sort of Britain, America and France, I believe, even sent troops that way, which is why I think it's Estonia is an independent country because they land there in Estonia which I think used to be part of Prussia as well obviously that all fell apart at the end of World War I because it was part of the German state as a result of the Treaty of Versailles and they then fought this big civil war um, obviously the Reds won in the end but the white movement was a big movement and this obviously plays a huge part in the Peaky Blinders in season 3 and as well, then you see a collaboration between the communists at home, the homegrown British socialists, uh, a lot of them, as I said, disillusioned soldiers returned from the front, and then the communists in Russia, the Bolshevik regime, because they then saw this as, wow, it's actually worked. The workers have been able to topple a government and such an autocratic one as Tsarist Russia. So for us, it must be possible as well. So this was a real sign for communists at the time that things could go the way they wanted them to. And then obviously you had the white Russians who were fighting against this and they actually continued to fight in various forms as either guerrillas or as a standing army in the first few years against the white, uh, the, uh, the communist Russians, the red Russians, right up until the Second World War. Hundreds of thousands of Russians joined the SS and joined the German invasion of Russia because they saw this as their chance to get at the Bolsheviks and if, you know, the Germans had succeeded in the East, then it's likely that they would have taken over administration so a lot of them worked as translators that kind of thing which is really interesting i find at least um, an interesting topic to look at and this is why because they were fighting this war in russia against the uh, the bolsheviks the red army that they are so desperate to get their hands on these vehicles which is again season three what that plays into with the factory but then at the same time, you have people in the factory who are British workers, British socialists and communists who do not want them to have this. And, you know, you have the whole thing where they go out on strike, people's action, that kind of thing, which is I just find it really interesting how they sort of blend foreign politics as well as sort of domestic issues um, and social issues at the time, how it all comes together in the Peaky Blinders, uh, which is one of the reasons why I absolutely adore the show. And of course, a very interesting thing is that the Shelby brothers, uh, I've hardly talked about them actually, there's uh, John Shelby, who's the youngest, Arthur Shelby, the oldest, and Tommy Shelby, the leader and the middle brother, and they are all gypsies, which is just, it adds a really interesting dynamic, because some of the languages in the Peaky Blinders, and there, there are quite a few languages spoken in the show, um, one of them is Romani, which is the language spoken by some of, uh, some groups of gypsies, um, the Roma gypsies, for example, um, and they do converse in Romani, and you have the whole kind of, even though it's the 1920s and it's Birmingham and it's the factories and, you know, the, the common English folk, you do have this kind of, uh, they repeat the phrase gypsy witchcraft, and, and they kind of joke about it as well, um, and they whole, the whole um, sort of relationship between the various groups because I'll, I'll get into some of the other gangs in a minute and most of them are sorted along sort of ethnic lines which is very interesting because you kind of have the same thing today in America obviously there are uh, contradictions and there were back then as well uh, but you have kind of gangs set along social and ethnic lines and the Shelby brothers they are a gypsy family um, so then you have that whole kind of sort of extra element added into the, this blend this modern blend which just gives the show something more uh, which i found very interesting um, of course the three brothers then have very much experience with animals so there's a great scene in the last season in season three where tommy's been arrested and the uh, the irishman actually uh, the all the police constables are ulster irish so protestants which is why they are sent over to birmingham to deal with the ira and the communists which they both hate equally as much and there's a great scene where he's in the cell and obviously there's the dog and he's kind of got this it's almost stereotypical but 
you know, it makes sense. He's he's great with animals, Tommy. So he's sort of psyching out the dog, and then that's why he's into horse racing so much and owning horses. Because obviously, gypsies are very good with horses, especially back then. Not necessarily modern uh, gypsies, but back then it was. You know, you you do see the caravans and the horses, and you know they look absolutely great. Um, and then you have the whole dynamic of the various gypsy families. So in the first season, you have this big gypsy war between the Shelbys and the Lees, the Lees being another family. And then it's really interesting that the way they resolve this is to marry John Shelby to Esme Lee uh, and then to literally create an alliance. So it's almost like a feudal dynasty doing the same thing. You know, I could be talking about Henry the Seventh here, but it's a similar kind of... Uh, dynamic with these warring families which is really interesting i find to sort of draw the parallels there now on the other side obviously in th this season which is still ongoing by the way which is uh, season four you have the italian gangs now actually in the second season you had another italian gang which was the sabini gang and sabini was a real man he really existed as did thomas shelby he was real billy kimber from the first season he was a real guy although they have sort of bended the facts uh, bent the facts a little bit um to make the narrative easier as i already mentioned with the difference in timeline between the real peaky blinders and the peaky blinders of the show but this new italian gang is very interesting because they represent a very different kind of gang so far they've all been kind of the the lads from your street versus the lads from the other street kind of thing whereas these are real an organized gang more in a modern sense obviously the mafia who were the um mafiosi from sicily originally but these are then the american ones in this one and obviously in america italian gangs played a huge role which is very interesting contrast to more of the kind of street gang vibe of uh, the gangs in great britain and obviously these guys are absolutely armed to the teeth and you you really learn to hate them if you start watching the show but uh it's very interesting how they play out all of these uh, Italians coming over from New York and uh, how, how they bring that into the mixer and at the same time my absolute favorite character in the show has got to be Alfie Solomons who is the leader of a Jewish gang and I believe the Jewish gang is based on a real gang uh, from London from Camden called the Yiddishers obviously Yiddish is the Germanic language spoken by various Jewish groups in Europe and um, he is just really funny his his character just gets me all the time um, so yeah I, I highly recommend that you do watch the show and, and watch out for Alfie Solomons when he uh, when he's in it but it's it's interesting that you know that um, Jewish people also had a gang in London at the time and for a while they were really big enemies with the Italians which played out but then for a long time at the start of the 20th century they actually had an alliance with the Italians because it allowed sort of the the trade between between them to carry on and a very interesting thing is that in the 19 late 1920s and 1930s this alliance fell apart because obviously Italy went fascist and these ideas from Italy from the motherland spread to London and obviously fascists and Jews they aren't really the best of friends um, so th th this alliance fell apart with that and actually the Yiddishes played a role in the Battle of Cable Street which was the very famous encounter between Oswald Mosley and his Union of British Fascists against uh, various people who were opposed to them and it's, it's interesting that they played a part in that as well. So thank you very much for watching. I realize I've rambled for a long time, but this is kind of what I intended this video to be because there were so many interesting points to discuss here about the various politics and history of the 1920s and of uh, what's shown in the Peaky Blinders. So I do hope that you will consider watching the Peaky Blinders and uh, checking out the series because I absolutely love it. I think there's so many great bits in. Uh, the acting's great, you know, the scenery, it, you really do feel like you're in the industrial heart of the 1920s, whereas you still have all of these historic things connecting it to times gone by and also things that will occur in the future. So it's on the BBC. Um, I realise a lot of you guys won't be able to get the BBC and, uh, you know, I'm sorry about that. There's not really much I can do. But if you can get it, then do consider checking it out. So thanks very much. I'm History with Hill, but don't forget to give me a thumbs up and check out the Peaky Blinders. And by order of the Peaky Blinders, I order you to have a good night.